one thing that's really interesting to me about chess is how different all of the pieces are because they all do different things and they all have a different kind of power and the way that they move actually holds some influence and power over the rest of the board. Right, take the knight, for example. The knight is not a straightforward piece, and this isn't a pun. Uh, it moves in an L. It moves two pieces and then to the left or the right, depending on which way you do it. So it's not some piece that's going to like hop way across the board and take over crazy big pieces. But what it does do is set up some really interesting moves and even some traps that you can set if you know what you're doing with it. But then you have pieces like the rooks and the bishops, and they can move an infinite amount of spaces in a particular direction. So a rook can move horizontally and vertically, and bishops can move diagonally in either direction. And those pieces, man, you do not want to be in the path of a rook or a bishop, because if you are, they're going to take you out. But then you have the queen, and oh my goodness. The queen, nothing compares to the queen on that chessboard. It moves in any direction, any number of spaces. There is not a single piece of chess that is safe from the queen. And then you have the king, and it's lame. The king can move any direction, but it moves one space. And half the time, it can't even attack, because if it were to attack, it would put itself in danger. It is probably, in my opinion, the most useless piece on the chessboard. And so if I'm honest with you, it sometimes feels like they put the wrong crown on the chess piece, doesn't it? Like it feels like the queen would really be better suited as the king. And all of the women in here are thinking, amen, pastor. <laughs> but seriously, if you could choose which piece was the king, you'd think pretty hard about it, wouldn't you? Right? You would come up with different rules and characteristics and different things you have to think through. And maybe you would even have like competitions, right? You could set up like a bracket, like March Madness, like chess triumph. And you could have these pieces duke it out and see which ones win. And the ones that lose, right, they don't make the cut. And so they could never be the king. But the reality is we don't get to pick. Right? We're stuck with this little old lame king chess piece, despite all of its flaws. We're continuing in our series, Kings and Kingdoms, this morning, where we're talking about the intersection between our faith and our politics. Now, last week, Nathan set up the concept of this chest of drawers here. And really, this is kind of how we think about life sometimes. We think about every aspect of our life as its individual drawer. And faith, sometimes we even think about as a drawer of its own. But last week, Nathan talked about how faith really isn't a drawer, but it's the chest itself, right? That it should influence every single area of our life. And so last week, Nathan talked about how faith should influence the politics of kingdoms. And today, I want to talk to you a little bit about how our faith should influence the politics of kings. See, I think a lot of times we think about the leaders and voices of authority in our life, kind of like we think about that little king chess piece. Like, we don't always love them, and we think we're stuck with them. We think we have no choice in what we do. But what's interesting is that Scripture actually teaches us that in a lot of ways, we do get to choose who our leaders are and who our, who our voices of influence are. And if that's true, then we should use wisdom and discernment in choosing who lead us and not just let anyone be king. And so that's what I want to talk to you about today. And the overall point of the message today is don't crown the wrong king. So if you have your Bibles or Bible apps, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 8 today. So back to the Old Testament. And I want to start by looking at verses 1 through 5 with you this morning. It says, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us such as all other nations have. Now this is an easy to miss transition moment, but it's a really pivotal point in the Bible. Because what happens here in 1 Samuel 8 marks the transition period from the period of the judges to the period of the kings. So up to this point in Israel's history, they did not have a permanent leader. And so when they came out of Exodus, out of Egypt, God was their ultimate ruler. And they get to a point where they enter in what's called the period of the judges. And during this time, scholars refer to what they go through as the sin cycle. So this is what would happen. Israel would sin. Usually it was idolatry. They would keep sinning. God would tell them to repent. They wouldn't. God would then allow them to be taken over and captured, and then they would cry out to God in repentance. God would send a judge to deliver them and rule over them for a certain period of time, and they would repeat this cycle over and over and over again all the way to Samuel. 
So Samuel gets to this point where he realizes he's old. He knows that his time as a leader is coming to an end. But he does something unprecedented. He appoints his own sons as leaders of Israel. Now, here's what we know about Samuel's sons up to this point. Their names. We don't know that they were great warriors. We don't know that they were spiritual leaders. They weren't priests or anything. They're just Samuel's sons. And what we learn right off the bat is that their leadership goes horribly because Samuel may have been this man who was spiritual and obedient to God, and so he was wise in his leadership of Israel, but we learn that his, his sons couldn't have been any different. It says that they, they went after dishonest gain, they accepted bribes, they perverted justice, and so it goes absolutely horribly. And so it's not shocking that Israel, when you get to verse 4, absolutely is like, we do not want them as our leaders. And so the elders, it's so bad that the elders of Israel get together, come to Samuel, and they say, hey, old man, get your sons out of the power. Now, their solution to the problem is not good. And we're going to get to that here in just a minute. But their rejection of Samuel's sons lead us to something that we need to think about as well, is that we should not blindly follow leaders. We have to use wisdom and discernment and who we trust as voices and positions of authority in our life. Because there is a big difference between a leadership position and a true leader. Now you would think that in this instance that Samuel's sons would be fit for this, right? I want you to think about this. They're the picture perfect example of leadership gone wrong. Think about their dad. Their dad is one of the most prominent leaders in Israel's history. He was the last judge, he was a military hero, he was a priest, and he was a prophet all wrapped up into one. Pretty good leader, right? And so you would think by definition then that his sons would have leadership in their DNA. And Samuel certainly thought this because he appoints them. But we learn pretty quickly, for all their pedigree, they were horrible leaders. See, not everybody is fit to be a leader. And this is a broad spectrum here. Not everyone's fit to be a president. Not everyone's fit to be a lawmaker. Not everyone's fit to be a pastor. Not everyone's fit to be a CEO or a manager in a workplace. And so we need to be careful in who we allow and choose to be leaders over us and leaders over other people because there are people who are not cut out for the task. And I think there's actually two criteria that we can study to look at this and wisely choose our leaders. And Paul is gonna give us these two criteria in 1 Timothy 3, two through seven. And he's talking about qualifications for pastors and overseers in the church here. He says, now the overseer is to be above reproach, faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him and he must do, in his, do so in a manner worthy of full respect. Because if anybody does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may be conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Now, remember that we're talking about pastors here, but Paul is gonna use this to talk about leaders. And he says the first criteria is that leaders have to have good characteristics. In order to be a good leader, there are inherent traits that are necessary for people to be able to lead and influence people to accomplish the mission at hand. And he's gonna go into a big list here, but there's a few in particular that he talks about that are really important, right? He says they must be able to teach, he says that they should be gentle, they should be able to manage their family well, they should be respectable, they should be hospitable. And so he's using these different things to, to talk about pastors and overseers in a church specifically, but the reality is we can apply these same things to the leaders in our life. And these are the characteristics that Paul would say you really should be looking for in people who lead you. And these characteristics, they go hand in hand. You don't just get somebody who's a good teacher and then ignore the rest of us. Because think about it in terms of Nathan and I. We're your pastors, right? And if we can't teach you, if we don't have the ability to teach, how are we gonna lead you on Sundays? And how are we gonna counsel you in your life? But if we have the ability to teach, but we don't have the wisdom to know how to handle different situations with wisdom and gentleness or firmness, we're gonna come off giving off the wrong message all the time. But even if we could do that, but we aren't welcoming and we're not respectable in our community, who's gonna listen to us? And so Paul says that the different characteristics are necessary for the leaders in our life. And so we need to look for the right characteristics in our leaders. 
And this applies to every aspect of your life. So come November, we're entering into the election season. I would challenge you, as you look at different political platforms and different people, don't just pick your politicians based on a powerful platform. Choose people that have the right characteristics of leadership. And this goes starting with the presidency, but this goes all the way down to the smallest local elections. We need to use wisdom and discernment in who we vote for. Don't just pick people because they're Republican or Democrat. Make sure the people you're picking actually have the capabilities and demonstrated leadership because these people are gonna lead your society, they're gonna create your laws, and they're gonna govern us until they're out of office. It's important to use wisdom and discernment because otherwise we're gonna crown the wrong kings. But this also applies to things like our careers. I would challenge you to look for the right leaders in your jobs. Now, I'm not telling you that if your boss has flaws, you need to go quit your job. Please don't do that. But here's what I'll tell you. If you're somebody right now who is looking at jobs, I would encourage you, if you have the ability, don't just be interviewed, but interview them. Ask questions about your boss. Find out who they will be. Find out what kind of work environment they create and how they operate within the context of their company and their employees. And sometimes you don't get that choice. You may not have the ability to do that, but here's what you can do at least is get whatever information you can on hand, take that information and make the best decision you can because you may not always get it right, but at least you can go into a job knowing that you made the best decision possible with the information you did have. And here's what I'll also tell you. If your boss does not have the characteristics of a leader, you don't have to leave. Understand the difference between authority and influence. Your boss has authority over you. That's a God-given authority. Not much you can do about that. But you can decide whether the way they lead, if it's not right, influences the way that you will lead and the way that you will operate in your career. So if you don't like the characteristics you see in your boss, don't model the way you do your job based on what they do. Model it on the good characteristics that Paul says we are to have. See, who we put the crown on matters. And so when it comes to our leaders, we need to make sure that they have the right capabilities and characteristics to lead. But as important as characteristics are, Paul would actually say that the second criteria is more important. Paul says that a good leader has to have good character. And he goes on, he lists different things. They are to be above reproach. They're to be faithful to their spouse. They're not to be a lover of money. And all of these different things, what Paul is saying is that all the leaders in the world can have the right characteristics, but what's more important is what they do when no one's looking than what they do in public. And this is especially important when you talk about pastors. I don't care how good of a preacher somebody is. I don't care how big of a church they built. I don't care if they've written a thousand books and a thousand devotionals and done all kinds of good mission work. If your pastors and your spiritual leaders in your life do not live in the way that the Bible, that God tells us we are to act, think, speak, and live, I would challenge you, run far, run fast. If they do not have the fruit of the Spirit evident in their life, and if they are not living out the example they are called to, they are not a leader. Because you can have the characteristics of a leader, but if you do not have the character of a leader, you are not a leader. Uh, Jesus actually talked about this in Matthew 7, 15 through 17. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Now, Jesus is speaking specifically here about false prophets, but the same principles apply to the spiritual leaders in their lives, right? If their actions don't back up their words, they're false leaders. And so when you're talking about pastors and church leaders and voices of influence in your life, as far as your faith goes, there's really important questions to ask. And we're gonna start by using the fruit of the spirit, right? So ask these questions. Who are they off the stage and out from behind the pulpit? Start there. Do they embody the fruit of the spirit? Are they loving? Are they joyful? Are they peacemakers? Are they patient? Are they faithful to God? Are they gentle in how they approach situations? Do they practice self-control? Do they embody all the fruit of the spirit or just a few qualities? And there's big questions to ask with that. Are they building disciples of Christ or followers of their name? Are they lovers of money? Are they faithful to their spouse? Are they building uh, their kingdom or are they building the kingdom? And do they take care of the people in their church well? Character makes or breaks a leader. 
So don't crown the wrong king. Don't just let somebody with good characteristics lead you because they seem like they have the right capabilities. Make sure that their character lines up with how the Bible says we are to live. And if we can do that, I think we'll have the right leaders in our life. Now, some of you may be sitting here thinking, Chris, that sounds great when you talk about my spiritual life. I would love it if my pastors had good character. I want the person leading the church that I attend to have good character. But like, does that stuff really matter in the real world? Like, my, my boss doesn't have to have good character if he's a good boss, right? I would say, no, it's not true. Remember the dressers. That's not separate from our faith. Right? Our faith should define every aspect of our life. And I would challenge you that it should define your career. And so I would challenge you to do your best to find leaders and people of influence, even in your jobs, that have the right character that is biblical character. Think about this for a second. Do you want your CEO of your company to have good character? Do you want your CFO who handles all the money to have good character? Do you want your boss to be honest? Do you want your boss to be patient? Do you want your boss to be a peacemaker? Do you want him to practice self-control? Right? Having good character is not unique to Christianity. But we can base the character upon which we choose our leaders on what our faith says is good character. What God dictates is good character. And I believe that matters. Who we put the crown on matters. So when it comes to your leaders, use wisdom and discernment in who you choose to lead you. Make sure they have the right characteristics, right? They need the qualities, but make sure their character lines up just as much as their capabilities do. And if you do that, you'll be on the right path. All right, look with me at our next verses. We're gonna jump back to verse five and look at verse six. So they said to him, remember these are talking about the Israel's elders here. It says, they said to him, you are old and your sons do not follow our ways. Now, appoint a king to lead us such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. So we'll stop there and then we'll keep reading in just a second. Israel's elders make the wise decision to not blindly follow leadership. So they look at them, say, you're old, you shouldn't have picked them, get them out of here. But what they do in turn was just as bad as Samuel putting his sons in leadership. In fact, we would go so far as to say this is sin. But Samuel, man, he's hurt by this. And, and you have to understand a little bit why, right? He knew this was coming. But when your sons get rejected as leaders, it's got to sting a little bit. And Samuel's actually so upset at what Israel does here that he goes and prays to God. But I want you to look at what God does when he replies to him in verses 7 through 9. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. He says, it is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. So Israel's sin was the rejection of God as their king. Whether they realized it or not, I mean, they had the best situation possible. They have the perfect, almighty creator God as their ruler. But they go, oh, give us some dude. Give us a regular king like the other ones. And what's interesting is God goes, man, this isn't even new. They've been doing this the whole time, ever since they got out of Egypt. And it's true. You can go back to the story of the Ten Commandments. Moses gets the Ten Commandments from God, walks off of Mount Sinai. What's the first thing he finds them doing? They're worshiping a golden calf. God just saved them in Egypt, and they're already worshiping a golden calf. And then you get to the period of Judges where they go through this cycle over and over and over again of sinning with idolatry against God. And so God says, this is not a new habit for you. You have been in the business of rejecting me as your king. But he warns them. He says, if you choose an earthly king, it's gonna go bad just as much as it has before. But he's gonna take it a step further in a second and he's gonna warn them. If you do this, this is the bed you make, you lie in it. I'm not saving you from this one. Look at how he warns them in verses 10 through 20. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters 
to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants, your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves will become his slaves. And when that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and go out before us and fight our battles. Look at the language that God uses here. He will take, he will take, he will take, he will take. The rule of an earthly king would not be everything Israel had hoped it would be. Why? Because the king would be human. In demanding a king... They are trading the perfect rule of God for the imperfect rule of man. And God warns them. He says, this is going to go horribly, right? He says, it's always going to cause problems because we don't have God's authority and perfection. So when we try to place someone in God's position, it's not going to work out. And, And here's the shocker for it, right? Because we're not God. And so when we try to do what he does, We're going to mess it up every single time. And so God warns them. He says, don't let this happen. Doesn't stop us from trying, though, does it? Look back at verses 19 and 20. What do they do? God gives them this big old warning. People refuse to listen to Samuel. They say, no, we want a king over. So then look at God goes, don't do this. I'm telling you right now, as the infinite, all-knowing God, it's going to end badly. And they go, no, God, we get it. We get it, you're all powerful. We've watched you do incredible things in Egypt. We've seen that you have power and dominion and authority over all. We have witnessed firsthand all of these amazing things that you do. But man, I tell you what, if you would just give us some regular dude, that would fix all our problems. Now it's easy to look at what Israel does here. But we read this and we go, I would never do that. I would not be so stupid as to pick a man over God. But I think Israel should be a warning to us. They witnessed firsthand the power and authority of God. And if they can see that and still choose an earthly king over God, are we not just as, if not more susceptible to have the same pitfall of disobedience? And so we have to be careful to not put people on God's throne. We're just as likely to crown the wrong king as Israel was. Because crowning the wrong king isn't just about trusting the wrong leaders. It's about trying to put people in the place of God. And so we have to be incredibly careful not to elevate people to the level of faith that we have in God. And God tells us, Exactly why, right? He says, look, people are gonna let you down because we're imperfect, because we don't have the authority of God. If that's who we place in power over us, if that's where our faith and our hope is, God says it's going to end horribly because there's not a single person in the history of humanity who can do a better job at being God than God. They may think they can, but they're gonna mess up royally. And so we have to be careful to make a distinction between the people of authority in our life and God. Because there's a big difference between kings and a king of kings. And we need to make that distinction very wisely. First, we need to understand that nobody has the same authority to God. And this is especially important with your spiritual leaders. None of us, no matter how good of a leader we are, have the same authority as God. We will not take his place. And the second you ever hear somebody say that they speak or they act with the authority of God, I would say that is a huge red flag to let you know that someone's got the wrong crown. And I want to be clear here. Do we have authority from God? Absolutely. We operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself said in John 14, we would do greater things than he did in life. But we we operate in the authority God has given us. We do not have the authority. And that's a big difference. We are ambassadors for the power and authority of God. 
we are not the king of kings. And so that's a big distinction to make, right? Because ambassadors, they have authority that's been given to them by their king, right? They can go out, they can, make, they can speak the truth that the king has asked them to. They make the announcements, the decrees of the king that have been given to them, right? That's what we do as ambassadors of the gospel, but we do not have the same authority. In the same way the ambassadors don't get to make new laws and decrees from the king, we do not have the authority to create new rules and commands for people. We do not have the authority of God. As pastors, we speak in the authority given to us by God. We are not God. Make that distinction carefully. Because as pastors and leaders, whether we're talking spiritual or not, the only authority we have is what's been given to us by God. And so if at any point, somebody that has a voice of influence in your life, I'm talking a pastor, church leader, podcaster, I don't care if they ever claim to speak or act in the authority of God, leave. Because they will lead you down a path of idolatry and destruction. We are not God. And we need to make that distinction very carefully. He holds the authority. And we only operate in what authority he gives us. Now, the second truth with this is that because people are imperfect, When we put them on the throne of God, it leads to absolute disappointment. Remember, we don't have the authority or perfection of God. And so when we put our complete faith and hope in people over God, it is an absolute disaster. Go back to what what God tells them, right? When when Samuel's reading them this list of things, he says it's gonna end in utter devastation. And you see it's this pain, this despair that causes them to cry out to God. And God says that is exactly what will happen every single time you put someone on my throne. That any time we elevate someone to the same level that we had God, it messes us up. And God's point is that people will always let you down. Right, if your faith is in a pastor, if it's in a church, if it's in a political party, if it's in a politician, if it's in your significant other, it doesn't matter. You can fill in the blank with whatever you want to fill it in with. Eventually, that thing is not going to work out. Because we are imperfect beings, no matter how hard we try to live up to a standard of perfection, we will fall short every single time. And if you have put your faith in people, when they mess up, it will rip apart the foundation you have built your life on. I've seen this happen so often in churches. I've watched people that have put their faith in pastors or put their faith in their church because their pastor has done incredible things or their church is doing amazing things and then something happens. Usually it's something big. If you go into recent history, right, we've seen this all over where pastors have had these big moral failings that have been all over the news or you find this church that does something wrong and in that moment when they mess up, it all falls apart. And I have watched events like that shake people so much to their core that they leave their faith. People walk away when they're disappointed by man. But that's why our faith and our hope has to be in the King of Kings, in the perfect, almighty God, because he alone is a firm foundation. If we put our confidence and our hope in people, it will fail every time. God doesn't fail. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 7. I love the way he said this in verses 24 through 27. He said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. Jesus spends much of the time of the Sermon on the Mount detailing what it means to have complete faith and obedience in God. And his point is that when we have faith and hope in God and you couple that with obedience, he says that is a foundation that nothing shakes. He says, but the opposite happens when our faith is in people. And he says, because it doesn't matter how big you build up that foundation, right? You can pick the best people on this planet. I'm talking the best leaders with the best character. You can build your foundation on them, but the smallest shift will cause that foundation to crumble out from under. But with God, everything changes. 
because God in his perfection is the best king that we can have in our lives. His law is perfect. His authority is ultimate. His love is never ending. So what better king can we crown in our lives than the king of kings, right? Who better to put the crown on than the God who holds all authority? Who better to put our faith in than the sacrificially loving God who gave his life for us? Who better to put our hope in than the king of kings who never fails us or forsakes us? God alone is worthy of the crown. And when we put our faith in him, it's a foundation that nothing shakes. So don't crown the wrong king. Put God back on his throne. Let him guide your life as the ultimate authority. And I promise you it'll make a difference in your life. There's two ways that I think we can challenge ourselves to respond in the politics of kings this morning. Uh, The first one is one that we've talked about a little bit earlier, but in the areas of life that we have control over, in the places that we have a choice, there needs to be action. We can sit back and we can do nothing and we can fret about all the people that come into power that are horrible, or when we do have the choice, we can do something about it. So I would challenge you this upcoming election season, vote. If you want the right people to be our leaders, give your opinions. Make the decision, right? And use wisdom and discernment in that. Pick people that have the right characteristics and the right qualities all the way from the presidency down to the smallest local elections. Be selective in the jobs you take. If you have the ability to do that, choose wisely where you go to work and who leads you in that. If you don't have a choice in that, choose wisely who you let influence how you work and how you live. In everything we do, we make the choice to pick the right leaders in our life. And it helps us to live and learn and grow in the right ways as followers of Christ. Now, you may be sitting here thinking, you're like, Chris, that all sounds great. I don't feel like I have control in any of this. Because maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, I'm stuck in a job that I don't love. And guess what? I don't get to leave it. I got a family to feed. There's mouths to feed. I have a family to provide for. I don't get to leave my job. I don't even get to worry about who my boss is. You think I care about who my boss is? Right now, I'm worried about whether that paycheck hits the bank on the 14th or the 15th. Or maybe you're sitting here thinking, Chris, I don't care what I do with the selection. I get it. I'm going to vote. But you know what? Ultimately, does it really matter? Because I'm worried one side's going to win. And if they win, it's the end of the country. Or maybe you're worried, you know what, doesn't matter what happens in the election, doesn't matter who wins, I still feel like it's the end of the country. Or maybe you're sitting here thinking, Chris, I've tried to do everything right. I've made all the right choices. I'm trying to be obedient. I feel like everything should be going my way, but I feel like my life's falling apart. The reality is, we don't always have control over everything. But there's some things that we do, but not every situation works out the way we want to. Sometimes we end up in jobs we don't like. We end up with bosses we don't like. Elections don't go the way we want to. There are times where our life goes no way that we thought that it should have. Can I tell you something? Those things aren't ever gonna bring you peace. But they're also not gonna take away your peace. Because having peace as a follower of Christ has nothing to do with who sits in the Oval Office by the end of November. It has nothing to do with what job you come home from. It has nothing to do with who your boss is. It has nothing to do with having this dream life that goes exactly the way we want to. Having peace as followers of Christ, it comes from having the right king on the throne. And so what I'll challenge you with is that if you want peace in your life, give God his crown back. Let him be the ultimate authority in your life. Let him be where your hope and your faith is as the king of kings. Right? Because kings... They're going to come and go. Kingdoms rise and fall. Kingdom of God, it's eternal. And the King of Kings, he's not going anywhere. And so when that's where our faith is, remember what Jesus says. It's the rock. It's the firm foundation. So we put him on the throne of our lives and let everything lead from that. I think there's two practical ways you guys can grow in this. If that's something you struggle with, I'll give you two very easy things to do. Rejoice and pray. Paul talked about it this way in Philippians 4, 4 through 7. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I tell you it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Let the Lord be near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Our worship and our prayer, these are practical steps that we can take to make sure that God's in control, that he's the one who holds authority in our life. 
Think about our prayer, right? We all pray when things are bad, but when we pray when things are good, right? When we're praying in all circumstances, we're reminding ourselves constantly that God loves us, that God hears us, that God answers our prayers, that he provides for us. Worship, it's easy to worship when things are good. But when we can worship and rejoice in every situation, right? On the mountaintops and in the valleys, we remind ourselves that he is our protection. He is our provision. He's the king who takes care of us. And Paul says, if we will do these two things in every situation, he says, the result is simple. That we will have a peace that comes from God, a peace that's supernatural, that doesn't even make sense to us. But more importantly, he says, it's a peace in Christ Jesus, which means no one takes it away because it comes from the king who holds all authority. So put the right king on the throne. It matters. In 1951, Renal Niebuhr, who's a pastor and author, wrote The Prayer for Serenity. Many of you probably know it. If you're not familiar with it, I'm gonna, we'll say it in just a second. But what I love about it is it became famous initially for being synonymous with organizations like Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a big part of their mission. Uh, but it's also synonymous, just a little funny to me, that uh, it is known for being like one of those cheesy prayers that ends up on like all the Christian wall art that you find for $4 on sale at Hobby Lobby. And as cheesy as it sounds, I think there's some real truth in it. Look at these words. It says, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the, chur- the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And isn't that really the heart of the message today? That in the areas we have control, in the areas where we have a choice, that we would have the courage to make a stand, that we would make the decision with wisdom and discernment to choose the right leaders in our life but in the areas where we don't have control, in the areas where we're unsure, we put God on the throne. We remind ourselves that we may not have control, but we worship the God who does. And in that, there's peace. So don't crown the wrong king this morning. Use wisdom and discernment in the leaders we pick, but ultimately, give God his authority, give him the control, the worship and the obedience that he deserves. When he's who's on our throne, we find peace in all circumstances. Let's pray.